we've been endeavoring to understand the nature of emptiness. But that puts us in a dilemma because we cannot have emptiness without fullness. And fullness is creation. And creation is movement. And it's the mind that, with the senses, translates this movement. And all of movement is ruled by the laws of nature. So how do we work this out when we're using the tools <coughs> of the movement to understand emptiness, which is not something and therefore is not bound by any laws. Mordenas Rudin was walking out of town and coming the other way, there was a traveler who could see that the Mola was an old Mola because of his turban and his dress and that he was coming out of town. So the traveler asked the Mola, how long will it take me to get to town? And the Mola said, I can't really say. Well, the traveler said, you've just come from town, haven't you? The Mola said, yes. Well, tell me how long it will take me to get to town. And the Mola <coughs> said, I can't really say. Well, the traveler looked at the Mola and thought to himself, well, that white beard could designate wisdom, but it also could designate stupidity. So he said, can you <laughs> tell me how long it takes? The Mola looked at him with a smile on his face and said, I can <laughs> say. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, of course, the traveler got really frustrated and peeved, and he went striding off down the road towards town. The Mola shouted, it will take you about an hour. <laughs> the traveler turned around and said, why didn't you tell me? And the Mola said, how could I when I didn't know how fast you were going to walk? <laughs> <laughs> Then there's that story that's been told before about the king and the queen who had a son, a prince who they adored to, to full measure and more. And they taught him all the ways of the court. They, they had him tutored by all the greatest pundits and philosophers and uh, mathematicians and so forth. Uh, and he was becoming uh, what would you would say would be a potentially very fine ruler. But suddenly he was struck by a very strange malady. One day he took off all his clothing and started to crow like a rooster and refused to sit down at the table. He refused to mix with the members of the court. All he would do would be sit under the table and eat corn from the floor. Well, of course, his, the king and queen were just beside themselves. What could they do? They called all the greatest physicians from far and wide to see if his, their son could be cured of this very strange malady. But none of them did any, any good at all. And then one day, uh, an old hermit turned up at the palace doors and said, I can, I can cure your son. Well, in desperate measures, even though he looked like somewhat of a ne'er-do-well, 
they said yes do whatever you can do but where is your bag of, where is your bag of potions and lotions all the other physicians and pundits who have been here have had powders and potions and lotions no no said the old hermit just leave me with him for seven days well of course the king and the queen agreed to this and immediately the old hermit took off all his clothes and got down under the table with the prince. And the prince eyed him, you know, and flapping his arms, he said, who are you? In a crowing kind of a way. And the old hermit said, why, I'm a rooster. Oh, said the prince, I'm so glad to have some company. So the two of them sat under the table, pecking at the corn, flapping their arms and crowing at one another for quite some time and the, the prince really got to become very very fond of his companion you know very companionable to have someone to crow with <laughs> so after a couple of days the old hermit came out from under the table and he started to stand up a little bit and walk around a little bit and um, the prince looked, what, what are you doing? You're a rooster. Oh, and no, said the, no, said the hermit. A, a, a rooster st can still walk around and crow and, and, and flap his wings. So, of course, by this time, the prince was really in, in great reverence of his companion. So he started to do the same thing as what the uh, sage did. And then the sage started to go out into the palace and walk. He'd still flap his wings and crow, but the prince followed him and started to emulate what he was doing. And then the next day, the hermit sat at the table and ate his corn off the table, off a silver platter. And the prince followed him, and then the sage gestured to the servants to bring food, and and they had a really delightful well. The prince crowed even louder <laughs> after having a nice repast, and, and he was quite accepting of what it was that the sage was doing. But then one day the sage started to discuss philosophy with the prince under the table, and the prince said to him, we're roosters. We don't have a care in the world. All we do is crow and eat. Oh, said the sage, but you know, there's, there's nothing stopping a rooster from pretending to be human and discuss human things. So from that day on, they got into very deep discussions of philosophical matters. Well, Soon the seven days were, were up, but before that, the, one day the sage got dressed. He put on trousers and a shirt, and the prince said, Roosters don't wear clothes. And he said, but it was feeling a little bit chilly, and there's nothing wrong with a rooster pretending to be human to put on clothing. So the prince did too. He used to put back on his princely garb. So by this time, in his princely garb, discussing philosophy, sitting at the table, eating human food. So after the seven days were over, the sage went to the king and the queen and said, I leave you, your son is now cured. He was back to acting like a normal prince. But before the sage left the prince, he said to the prince, Remember, I want to ask you, what did this sage hermit say to the prince when he was departing from him? Remember, what is it? Whether you're a rooster mm -hmm. and pretending to be human, mm -hmm. who you really are. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Mm -hmm. Isn't it so? 
But we can also ask ourselves, what do these stories have to do with understanding the nature of emptiness? But I think we pretty much know what we're about here by now, don't we? As we remember, as was just said, that we do have a dilemma, as we do in the moments of life. Because stillness for us is a reality. It's a presence that never leaves us. An awareness that's always there. We're always still. And yet, life in all its forms, translated by the senses and the mind, is in constant movement. And yet, for us, there is no conflict at all. But how do we reconcile them? How do we understand them in relationship to emptiness and fullness, which seem to be two distinct things, although we know emptiness is not a thing? How are we really on about here? I think I've just done myself out of a job, so <laughs> painted myself into a corner, you might say. <laughs> or have we? <laughs> it seems not. <laughs>